Welcome to the first in a series of features on women's health. In this series, we'll be discussing a range of topics, our first to be covered being pelvic floor health and continence. It was reported in early January 2013 that severe incontinence affects more than 315,000 people in Australia. Now, two thirds of those are women. In addition to medical issues arising from the condition, there are associated financial costs, impacts on carers, social impacts, and of course, stigma. I'm joined by Dr. Margaret Sherborne, who's the Manager of Physiotherapy, the Women's Hospital, Senior Lecturer in Physiotherapy at the Melbourne School of Health Sciences, the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Margaret. Hello, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Incontinence. Is it a normal part of the ageing process? John, incontinence is not a normal part of the ageing process because incontinence can affect people of all gender, age and cultural background. It's more common in old age, but because not every ageing person has incontinence, we can't say that it's a normal part of ageing. Certainly, men and women over 75 years of age, uh, about 40% of that age group, do have some form in, of incontinence. That could be because of the decline in brain function. Control of the bladder is really complex and it took us many years to gain that control when we were toddlers, part of our maturing brain. And as soon as we get some decline in brain function, that control does go. More women than men suffer from incontinence and that's most likely due to the life stages that women go through, such as childbirth and menopause both of which have an effect on pelvic structures. For men, incontinence becomes more prevalent after 60 years of age, once prostate gland enlarges, and the bladder issues become more of urgency, bladder urgency, and uh, voiding dysfunction. Incontinence is more prevalent than asthma, anxiety disorders, and arthritis in the Australian population, so it does have a large economic impact, both in direct costs, loss of productivity, and the opportunity costs of unpaid care provided by family members to those with incontinence. Now, if these figures are surprising to you in your practice, it may be because we know that around 70% of those who suffer with incontinence don't mention it to anybody, let alone their GP. Why would this be? There are two main reasons for patients not mentioning incontinence. It's, first one is embarrassment because incontinence impacts on self-esteem, on motivation, on independence. And the second reason is that they're possibly never asked about it. For women, I would suggest that in a GP practice, a pap smear would be a really good time to ask about bladder problems, and for men, during a prostate checkup. You might think, who should I target? Who are most at risk of urinary incontinence? Those at a higher risk of bladder dysfunction are those who are pregnant or early postnatal period. Women go through the menopause. Anyone with a chronic cough or with a neurological condition where there's reduced midbrain perfusion, such as with Parkinson's disease, or dorsal column neuropathy, such as multiple sclerosis, or those who've had a stroke, a CVA. You could also ask young elite athletes who do a lot of jumping, running, uh, they are more likely to have stress incontinence. Anyone who has a high waist circumference, who is obese, is at a higher risk of having incontinence, and also those who do heavy lifting who, or who have prolonged standing as part of their occupation. Incontinence symptoms can vary from such things as urinary frequency, urgency, urge incontinence, nocturia, bedwetting, recurrent UTIs, stress incontinence and of course poor stream. Fecal incontinence symptoms are also very common in the community. Which general practice based assessment tools and general investigations can be undertaken? Initially, take a history specific to the symptoms in order to determine the type of incontinence. The two major types of incontinence that will uh, be were presented at GP practice are stress incontinence and urge incontinence. Stress incontinence is predominantly a mechanical issue where the 
intra-abdominal pressure is too great for the closure pressure of the urethra. Whereas urge incontinence causation is wide and varied. Most likely it's neurological, but it could also be from infection. The, whatever the cause, the outcome is overactivity of the smooth muscle of the bladder wall, the detrusor muscle, called detrusor overactivity. So questioning will seek the causation of the stress incontinence and seek out the symptoms. For stress incontinence, questions will be along the lines of, do you leak when you cough, sneeze, lift, jump, etc. To ascertain the cause of urge incontinence, questions will ask about urgency, frequency of urination, and nocturia, getting up at night to void. You should also ask questions about infection as a cause and about bedwetting, nocturnal enuresis. Two other less common types of incontinence that may present to GP practice are voiding dysfunction and anal incontinence. Voiding dysfunction is the causes of voiding dysfunction are normally a underactive bladder and difficulty emptying fully. So the questions will go along the lines of the stream, whether it's a split stream, a slow stream, hard to get started, whether the patient strains with voiding. For anal incontinence, uh, questions would be along the lines of ascertaining whether there's diarrhoea, incontinence, there may be some dietary questions, and again, questions about infection of uh, get that infection from uh, food or acute versus chronic anal incontinence. After a simple history taking, then a pelvic examination should be undertaken for exclusion of masses and also palpation of the organs and uh, support structures. At this time, it's probably useful to test the pelvic floor muscle function as well and to take a swab for the bacterial vaginosis, uh, for a candida, and also to do a urinalysis. Initially, imaging is not required for simple incontinence, but if you suspect upper tract pathology, it's useful to get an ultrasound of the kidneys. If bladder pain is suspected or is reported, a cystoscopy to visualise the urethelium is useful. If the patient, if you think the patient may go on to surgery, then urodynamics would be the test of choice. During your pelvic examination, when anal incontinence is reported, also uh, visualise the external anal sphincter for reddening, erythema, excoriation, hemorrhoids or skin tags to exclude uh, hemorrhoids as a cause of the incontinence in particular. What are some of the conservative management options in regard to incontinence symptoms? In the first instance, a referral to a continence and women's health physiotherapist or a continence nurse would be the first choice for conservative management. If the patient before you presents with ongoing and what you think is incurable incontinence, then containment becomes the major choice of treatment. So a referral to a continence nurse for aids and appliances is the best choice for this patient. When conservative options for treatment are exhausted or unsuccessful, who else can GPs refer to? There's a wide range of medical specialties a GP can refer to once conservative managers, management has been exhausted. For women, who experience incontinence, the subspecialties are urogynecologist or gynecologist. These are the surgeons who will then undertake a surgery, surgical management. For males with incontinence, refer to a urologist. If the patient is aged and has other complex comorbidities, 
then a geriatrician is the referral pathway of choice. For a patient with anal incontinence, there are two choices, either a colorectal surgeon or gastroenterologist, depending on the symptoms that the patient presents with. So it's a wide range of choice. Are there funding schemes available for people with permanent or incurable incontinence? Yes, John, there are funding schemes through the Commonwealth Government and through state and territory governments. The Commonwealth Scheme is the Continence AIDS Payment Scheme, or CAPS Scheme, for those with permanent neurological incontinence, for those who have permanent incurable incontinence, not through a neurological condition, and who are also pensioners, have a Centrelink pensioner card. Patients who access these schemes do need to be Australian citizens or permanent residents. The Department of Veteran Affairs has their own scheme and, as I said, each state and territory has their own. So I would suggest that GPs in each state look at the Department of Health in websites in your own territory or state. There is also the Continence Foundation website and the Continence Foundation of Australia helpline. The number is 1-800-33-0066 and links to that website and resources are at the end of this module. Margaret, any closing remarks? John, the main message I'd like to leave with GPs uh, who have uh, been through this module is that all health practitioners can manage urinary incontinence. It can probably be better managed by all of us if we simply ask questions about incontinence and understand where we as health practitioners can learn more, uh, such as listening to this module, and give patients encouragement to undergo conservative treatments before they have surgery, and offer them conservative management follow-up after surgery. Even older and frailer people can improve if they're given the opportunity for treatment. And finally, I'd like to uh, in reinforce the fact that the Continence Foundation of Australia is a, an organisation, it's a government's peak body for incontinence, but it's an organisation not only for patients, but for health practitioners as well. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to discuss this topic, please comment below.